Welcome to your Construction Safety Association of Manitoba's Virtual Toolbox Talk Series. Brought to you by CSAM The Safety Conference, Canada's premier and North America's largest construction safety conference. Encountering hazards during our work tasks is inevitable. There are hazards in every aspect of our jobs. Some more dangerous or more severe than others, but hazards exist everywhere. Even if you've been trained to do that task, or you've been doing it for numerous years, hazards still exist. Today, we are discussing the hazard assessment. That document that should be filled out to verify that your crew has been made aware of the hazards and the control measures to mitigate them. A hazard assessment should be completed prior to beginning any work. The intent is to identify the hazards and control them before they cause an incident, a near miss, or even an injury. Did you know that in Manitoba, it is a requirement in the Workplace Safety and Health Act under the duties of a supervisor to ensure that workers are made aware of all known or foreseeable risks to the safety and health in the area where the work is being performed. So how do you verify or prove that your workers been, have been made aware of these risks? By completing the document, identifying those hazards and the applicable control measures. That's your due diligence. Even workers have some legal duties and responsibilities outlined in the Workplace Safety and Health Act. They must take reasonable care to protect their safety and health, as well as that of any person that may be affected by their work actions. The frequency that this form should be completed is going to vary from site to site or even what's stated within your own company policy. Be sure to follow the strictest rule or policy that you've been made aware of. However, if no policy or frequency has been stated in your orientation to the company or that job site, you still need to complete this document. The Manitoba legislation states that the minimum frequency is threefold. One, as the hazards change. Two, as the job progresses. And three, when you move locations. The intent is to complete the assessment at that task location in order to properly identify the specific hazards that workers will or may be exposed to. The site safety rep should also take part in this assessment in order to help develop applicable control measures. This is the CSAM hit list. This multi-form can be used to complete hazard assessments, inspection checklists, and toolbox talks. This carbon copy format, when used in a booklet format, is a type of verification for the prime contractor and your company. The yellow copy or the carbon would go to the prime contractor as verification that your assessment was completed. You would keep the original or the white copy and submit it to your office. The hit list is just one style of a template available. You may call it a PSI, a JSA or a JHA, an FLRA or an FLHA. Regardless what the template is, the process is still the same. Identify the hazards, rank the hazards based on severity and probability, and make sure you add the applicable control measures. Here we have some workers doing their tasks. Let's take a closer look to see what hazards these workers are being exposed to, and can we spot any of the potential hazards? Remember, we should also take some time to think about the what-ifs when we are working. Are there other workers in our vicinity? If so, does their work now affect my work? What about the lighting conditions or the sound levels in my work area? All these things should be considered when completing your hazard assessment. Let's see some other workers doing their daily jobs and discuss what hazards we see in more detail. The difference between a hazard and a task is the task is the job that you are doing and the hazard is the risk associated with that job. In this first picture, we have a worker who is sanding drywall. Now one of the obvious hazards is going to be the dust and particulates from the sanded material. But we must also take a look at the what ifs. This is a repetitive motion task and there could be shoulder strain and neck strain. To protect himself from the obvious hazards of the dust, he is wearing a respirator and gloves to keep grip on the sanding pole. 
how do we prevent and reduce the risk of the MSI with the shoulder strain? By taking little micro breaks, putting your arms down and doing some light motion with the arms in a downward swing. In this next picture, we have two workers installing some HVAC ductwork. So the task is the install and the hazards related to that are shoulder strain. As you can see, the worker's hands are well over their head and that could be for a prolonged time frame. They are also working at heights. So in that aerial lift, as you can see, they are tied off appropriately. In this third picture, we can see a worker using an oxyacetylene torch to cut some steel. So the task is to notch out that steel and the hazards that he is exposed to are heat sources, sparks, sharp edges, and possible fumes from the steel and the oxyacetylene itself. In this last picture, you can see we have a worker removing old shingles from the roof. If we use this example to complete our hazard assessment, let's take a look at it in some greater detail in order to complete this document. One of the hazards this worker is experiencing is working at heights. Now, once we've identified the hazard, we must also rank that hazard based on probability and severity. In other words, what are the chances of this worker falling? And if this worker were to fall from height, how severe of injury would he receive? Now remember, when we do this, we don't have any control measures yet. So the hazard is working at height. Ranking it is going to be your choice, as long as you can verify and justify why it is ranked that way. Because this is a critical task of working at heights, we could rate it as a one or a two, meaning immediate danger or a serious injury. It's also going to be rated as an A or a B, high probability of falling or a very reasonable chance of falling. Once we've rated that hazard, we now can add our applicable control measure. And as you can see, this worker is wearing a harness attached to a rope grab and a lifeline, which is all supported by the anchor point. When we assign responsibility for who is responsible to control this hazard, it will be that worker. Another hazard this worker is going to be exposed to is slips and trips. How would we rate that hazard? Again, it could be a two or a three due to the nature of the work and the height taken into account. So it could be a serious injury or it might be a minor injury, depending on if the worker just has a small slip and does not fall. When we rate the probability, it is probably going to be reasonably probable. So we'd rate that as a B. Because of the slope of the roof, removing of the shingles, that would may become very slippery. There's not much for grip there. An appropriate control measure is going to be good footwear and good footing. The action by is going to be that worker. One of the potential hazards, if you look on the background just over his shoulder, you can see there are two holes cut into the wood. Those are potential trip hazards. If this worker walks back over to that gable and has a misstep, his foot could get caught in one of those chimney holes. We must identify that as a potential hazard. Again, the identified hazard, the ranking, the appropriate control, and the action by. Another hazard this worker may be exposed to could be the environmental hazards. It could be windy, we can see that it is a sunny day, and is that going to heat up and cause this worker to potentially overheat, become sweaty, his glasses may fog up? All of these things must be taken into account. If we don't identify them before we begin work, we have the potential to forget about it once it starts to occur. The intent of your hazard assessment is to identify the existing and the potential hazards. Hazards should be ranked according to the severity and probability of that hazard causing an incident. So let's break this down. 
The numbers will represent the severity of an incident. One means imminent danger. This means there is a very high risk of something catastrophic happening. Two, a serious injury. A worker could be required to go to a hospital if they are injured. Three, minor injury. This is something that could likely be attended to by a first aid kit. Four, negligible. This means that if something were to occur, the worker could in essence walk it off. This would be in a well-controlled environment. Five, not applicable. If you have a list of predetermined hazards, but none of those hazards apply to your scope of work for that day or for that task, you can rank them as a five. The alphabet letters will represent the probability of that incident occurring. All hazard rankings should combine both the numerical and the letter values. So let's break this one down. A, highly probable. This means the chances of that hazard causing an incident are very high unless controlled properly and immediately. B. Reasonably probable. This ranking means that something could likely occur very soon or more frequently. C. Remote. When we use this ranking, we are saying that the chances of this hazard causing an incident are very low, but still exist. D. Extremely remote. This is similar to a once in a blue moon quote. Again, this would be in a well-controlled environment. Be sure that when you rank your hazards, you rank them pre-control. As we can now see on this completed hit list, we have identified everything we just saw with the worker on the roof. As previously mentioned, you may be using a different template for your hazard assessment document, but the basic foundation is still the same. Just apply the principles of this process to your format. Let's take a look at this format below in more detail. We have identified this form as being used for a hazard assessment by Xing the top left box. We follow that with all relevant information with the, your company name, the site address, and the supervisor and safety rep names. The middle section will help us ensure that the site safety is ready to go by circling OK or fix. Anything we have identified as fix might be a hazard over and above those task specific hazards. So these should be controlled ASAP as well. Where the section says date on the right hand side, we want to be sure that we always include the year, not just the month and the day. As we head to the bottom section, we have identified all the hazards we have discussed along with the ranking and the applicable control measures. Verification of workers being made aware of the hazards that they will be exposed to is verified through their signatures on the very bottom of this form. Each worker on site involved with this assessment should sign their own name that they have read and been made aware of the hazards and the control measures that apply to them. So let's review the importance of identifying and documenting your hazards prior to beginning work. If a hazard is not identified, that incident, near miss, or injury may occur. Now, can we identify every hazard? No, but do your best to take a close look and break down the hazards of that task. So we have identified how to identify your hazards by looking at the task, breaking them down with the existing and the potential hazards, and by documenting them. We have also discussed how to communicate those hazards to your crew. Have the crew review and sign off on that completed hazard assessment. They should also be part of the process to identify what hazards they see or they have encountered previously during those tasks. Now we have to control those hazards to reduce the risk of them causing that injury or incident. Control measures should be appropriate and reasonable. Well, that does it for now. Remember, the document is your verification that your due diligence is being met. So now, it's my turn. I'm going to go fill up my hazard assessment.